All right, John chapter 1. John chapter 1. Uh, let's pick it up in... Um, I will just read this one verse and we'll go to prayer. And we're going to talk about Jesus being the lamb tonight. Amen. What is the purpose of the lamb? What function does the, does the lamb do? Uh, is, is Jesus literally a lamb? Is he literally a lamb? And we're go, we'll examine that tonight. John chapter 1 verse 29. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold. The Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Don't you think about those, the thing that John said tonight, all right, concerning Jesus. Father, I pray your blessings upon your word tonight. And Father, we lift up our neighbors and our family members, Lord, that are suffering, that are struggling. I pray, dear God, that you would give them help, give them encouragement, give them blessing. Thank you, Lord, for those that have reached out uh, to me to be a blessing, to try to encourage me. I appreciate that. I pray, Lord, you'd bless these people. Bless them greatly for that. And I pray, dear God, that you would continue to use and bless uh, our little church in a mighty way. And Father, we're, we're content with doing whatever you want us to do, how you wanted to do it, to however many you want us to do it to, we're content. All we ask, God, is that you just give us the opportunity to serve. It doesn't have to be in a big way. Just give us, give us the chance. Give us the privilege to serve you as free servants. Because we don't owe you a debt. That was paid for already. It was a free gift from our Savior. And Father, we are very, very thankful for that. So we gladly serve you and we pray, dear God, you would always lead us into situations where we can be a blessing to your kingdom and also where we can be a blessing in other people's lives, people who are struggling, people who are hurting, people who are sick, people who are in prison, people, Father, who are very, very bad sinners. Father, even the, the, the most bitter, evil sinner in the world can be broken down. And I pray, dear God, that you would do that and use us for that, for, for that in their lives and for your kingdom's sake. Bless your word tonight. Open it up to our eyes and help us to understand, God, the things that are written therein. We love you and we thank you for this Bible and what it means to us. We praise you, Father, and we thank you in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said... Amen. I've been spending the last couple of days researching what foolish people have said about the King James Bible. Because I'm dealing with, uh, in the Watchman series, I'm dealing, I'm getting moving into 2 Peter chapter 2. And Peter describes the false teachers that would be in the last days. And he said that they'll, they'll even deny the Lord that bought them. And you'd be amazed at what has flown out of some preacher's mouths. Concerning Christ and his sacrificial atonement. It, it follows along a similar line of what is spoken by people in other religions. That they despise what we believe and, and hold sacred. Is that God sacrificed or allowed to be sacrificed his only begotten son. To take upon himself the sins of the world. And there are people who look at that and say, that's child abuse. And I won't, I won't serve a God who would abuse his own child that way and, and be mean to his own son. They don't understand it. They do not get it. There, geez, God's son was a willing participant. He loved those whom he saved. Did it for, re, did it for them. And uh, they just don't get it. But then... Then it said, by way of whom the, the way of truth will be evil spoken of. So Peter warned that, number one, they would go against the gospel. Number two, they would go against the Bible. They would speak evil of the way of truth. Psalm 19 uses that exact phrase, the way of truth. And it talks about God's commandment. So he links it there with the Bible. And all these people that are speaking out against our Bible, how dare they? They hate it. They hate this book. They think it's archaic. They think its words don't mean anything. They think it's full of uh, 
wrong doctrine that it that it uh, that added to or took away from God's word. Same thing we say about their Bibles. They accuse the King James of accuse the King James translators of being unlearned and ignorant men that didn't know what they were doing and didn't know how to translate Greek into English and all, all kinds of nonsense. And I listened to a man by the name of James White. Uh, Chris Pinto has debated him and interviewed him um, out of because of Chris Pinto's, um, I guess, love for the King James or whatever. And he's kind of gone on the offensive against James White. James White is a professor, of course. And he thinks he's smarter than everybody else. But he despises those who believe this Bible is right. He despises it very arrogant, in a very arrogant way. And I listened to him the other day talk, and I just caught him in one lie after another. But there was one thing that kind of, that he said that I went, hmm. And he said that a certain Greek word in Revelation wasn't translated right in the King James. So I looked that word up. And I'll make a long story short, I found out that James White lied and God didn't. That's what I found out. I won't get into the details of it, but that's what I, that's what I, it took me a little while to get there. Okay? So I don't recommend you listening to a bunch of garbage on the internet, because it'll throw you. It, I promise you, it's, it's tough. And if you're not very firmly grounded and settled in the Word of God, um, anything could happen. But anyway... So John sees Jesus coming, John chapter 1, verse 29, unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. What is the significance of Christ being the Lamb? We're going to look at that. And did he literally mean that Jesus was literally a Lamb? Now, there are a lot of good people, don't get me wrong, there are a lot of good people who see this as a metaphorical statement that he, Jesus isn't really a lamb, but he is a representation of a lamb. He symbolizes a lamb. He's doing what a lamb does and so on. I sort of take a, a little bit different view from that. I think Jesus is the lamb. I don't think God created everything in this world, including lambs and oxen and serpents, and then decided one day to make heavenly illustrations out of what he had created to help us see how he works. I think the things of this earth and that are in this earth are a shadow of things in heaven. And so I don't believe, what is the word they use? Anthropomorphism. Where when the Bible says that God has eyes and God has arms and God has legs and God has feet, they would say, now God doesn't really have arms and legs and eyes and feet and toes. He doesn't really have that. That is an anthropomorphism. That is a statement that God makes so that we can understand what God wants us to understand about him. But he's not really pictured with arms and legs. I don't believe that. I think God has feet. I think he has legs. I think he has a right arm and a right hand and a left arm and a left hand. I think he's got a head. I think he's got eyes. I think he has ears. Amen. And so I just what I believe about it. I believe the beast that rose up out of the sea did have seven heads on it and ten horns. It was a ten point whatever it was. But it had it had them. Literally it had them. And John wasn't just describing in metaphorical terms even though the symbolism you can find it in the Bible, I believe it really looked that way. And I believe that Jesus, turn to Revelation chapter 5, I believe that Jesus really is the Lamb. The Lamb. Now, who knows anything about lambs? Just the simple things. Lamb doesn't taste as good as people say. I, that I believe. Okay. I've had lamb before. It's all right. But if you offered me lamb in one plate and fried deer steak in another and a bottle of ketchup, I'll take the deer steak and ketchup. 
It's just me. Okay. But so what do you know about lambs? Are they mean, vicious, prowling animals that looking to devour innocent creatures? No, they're very gentle. Okay. And they're very passive, soft. Okay. Do they, when they, the sound that comes forth out of their mouth, does it, does it bring terror into our being? Do we have the doodads stand up on the back of our neck? Are we, did you hear that lamb? Oh my goodness, let's get out of here. Is that, no, uh uh-uh. It's very gentle. That's the way our Savior, but just think about it. He's both the shepherd and the sheep. He is. He's all of it. Yes, Roy. Really? Maybe that's why I don't have lambs following me. I will never, ever, ever put my, enclose my mouth over a sheep's nostrils. I don't ever see that happening. I believe you. I just don't see it happening anytime, ever. So anyway, look at Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5 is about the book. It's setting up the end time events of the unsealing of the book. In Revelation 5, verse 1, I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who's worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. No man in heaven nor in earth, nor, neither under the earth was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open the book and to read the book, neither to look thereon. Worthiness has, I think, probably a lot to do with sin or sinlessness and verse 5 he said um, one of the elders said unto me weep not behold the lion of the tribe of Judah the root of David hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof so in verse 5 he's a lion but in verse 6 and I beheld and lo in the midst of the throne and the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain having seven horns And seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. I've made it a point to make you aware of the fact, I believe the seven horns, which both the seven eyes and the seven horns, both of them represent the seven spirits of God. That's found in Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. You'll find them there. I made it a point to draw your attention to the man Samson. When Samson was a full grown man, he had not ever had a razor taken to his head. He had not ever shaved his beard, never shaved his mustache, had never cut his hair at all. I mean, he was just a woolly booger. But he had taken his hair and he had braided it into seven locks. And I believe those seven locks are meant to represent the seven horns that are on the lamb that you see here in Revelation chapter 5. So Samson is portraying Christ. Where is his, listen to this now, where is his source of strength? Is it in his muscles? Is it in his intellect? Um, Does he take vitamins every day? Does he drink an elixir every day? No. No. The source of his strength are those seven locks of hair, which represent the seven spirits of God. And of course, in the tabernacle, the seven spirits of God were represented by the seven candlesticks ornamented with 66 decorations. Exactly. Exactly. I Fell out of my chair almost when somebody sent that to me. I thought, that is the coolest thing in the world. The fact that God's showing you. There's going to be 66 books in the Bible. You can't even fathom what that means. They didn't have no idea why God told them to do that. But he put 66 decorations on, that, on those candlesticks there in the, in the tabernacle. So think about it. What is the source of our strength? It's the seven spirits of God represented or extending out of the written word of God. So 
can the Spirit work in me mightily through a book that is flawed or has errors in it? Or where we would say we don't really know that this is exactly what God said. We have some doubts about this. Or a book, as in the case of the, the Greek text that all the modern translations are based on, the Nestle Aland Greek text, 28 revisions it's had since the late 1800s, meaning they've altered it 28 times. They've changed the New Testament of the Bible 28 times. If somebody came to you saying that they needed to rewrite the title to the land that you own, the house that you live in, or the rental agreement, Matthew, that you signed, if somebody, if they said, well, we're going to change, all, we're going to rewrite the language of it. We're just going to change a few things in it, but it wouldn't affect you in any way. Do you, do you, is that okay with you? No, absolutely not. Because you don't trust those, you don't know those people, you don't trust those people. Why are they wanting to change things all of a sudden? I mean, we went for thousands of years from the time that the New Testament started being written up until the late 1800s when Westcott and Hort introduced these fake manuscripts. We were fine with what the Word of God was and where it came from. And then now all of a sudden the addition of this Vaticanus and the Sinaiticus Greek text, which disagree with the Greek that underlies our King James thousands upon thousands of times. We're told that that's what we should put our trust in. I don't trust that. That's ever changing. That's like ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Okay, keep changing it. Maybe one of these days you'll get right, but they so far they haven't done it. But anyway, that's our strength. So the lamb here is also the lion. And he has, of course, the seven eyes and seven horns. Those are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. When he had taken the book, the four beasts, four and twenty elders, fell down before the lamb. There it says it again. By the way, I believe 28 times, 28 times, the King James uses the word lamb with a capital L in it. That is four times seven. Four for the Gospels. Seven for perfection, completion. This, it is finished. It's done. It's over with. Stop this. We're done here. Okay. That lamb is mentioned 28 times, I believe. Capital L in the King James. Having every one of them harps, golden vials full of odors which are the prayers of saints. So, and, and again, I, I just, in my humble opinion, I don't think Jesus went and put on a lamb costume. I believe that he literally is the lamb of God who is simultaneously the lion of... The, well, don't lions eat lambs? Every chance they get. I believe that he is simultaneously man and God at the same time. I don't quite understand how, but I believe that's what he is. And I don't believe that God... After the creation, looked at all the animals and said, okay, that animal's gentle. Maybe I'll, hey, Jesus, what do you think about pretending you're a lamb? And Jesus went, Bah! God says, you got the job. That's pretty good, by the way. No, I think he was, a, I think he is who he is from before the beginning. He always was the lamb, is the lamb, always will be the lamb. Amen. And God created the things in this world modeled after the things that are in heaven. I mean, after all, the false prophet in Revelation chapter 13, he has two horns like a lamb. That's his symbol. And I'm going to have dozens of people on the Internet going, Hoggard, he's in the Illuminati. I, I had a guy the other day, I went and read some YouTube comments about some things I said last week. And sure enough, guy's going, he's a shill. I'm convinced he's a shill 
for the new world order. Where's the money I'm supposed to be getting from that? I haven't gotten the money yet. Anyway, turn to uh, Genesis 22. Look at this. Look at your bot. This man, the King James says it better than any Bible anywhere. 22 is the number for revelation. God's revealing something in Genesis 22. What's he, what is he revealing? Who's he revealing? He's revealing his son. And, and the purpose of his son on this earth. Genesis 22. God says it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham. Said unto him, Abraham. And he said, behold, here I am. And he said, take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac. It's, Isaac is Christ. Abraham is the father. Whom thou lovest and get thee into the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering. And um, upon one of the mountains of which I will tell thee of. So they traveled and journeyed. And if you look at verse 6. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering. Laid it upon Isaac, his son. He took the fire in his hand and a knife. And they went both of them together. Was Abraham really going to kill him? Yeah. I believe he was. He wasn't. And we know that the New Testament tells us why he believed that it, even if he killed him, that God was going to raise him back from the dead because God swore to Abraham that it was through Isaac shall thy seed be called. It'll be through Isaac. It's not it's not Ishmael. That was your and Sarah's crazy idea to come up with that. I never blessed that. I never said that it's going to be through Sarah. She's going to have Isaac and the seed is going to be counted through Isaac. So Abraham's walking three days with this in his mind. He's not, he's not told Isaac what's about to happen. But in his heart, he's, I mean, can you imagine the battle he's fighting? So verse six, Abraham took the wood and burnt offering, laid it upon Isaac, his son. He took the fire in his hand and a knife. And they went both of them together. Isaac's carrying the, the wood and the, um, of the burnt offering. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. Abraham's got faith, doesn't he? He can't see in the future. He just trusts God. Isaac, God will provide himself. Now I look at it like this. I look at it like here's what Abraham's saying. God will provide that he himself will be the lamb for the sacrifice. That's what I think Abraham is saying. And Abraham doesn't know Jesus Christ from Adam. But he believes that God is going to provide himself somehow, some way to be the lamb of the sacrifice. And that he won't have to, or maybe he won't have to kill his only begotten son. He wasn't just lying to cover up the fact of what he was going to do to Isaac. He was saying the truest statement that you could possibly make about what God was going to do 2,000 years. And it was 2,000 years from Abraham on the exact spot that Abraham offered Isaac. I believe they put that cross in the ground on the same spot. It's the mountains of Moriah, which is right outside Jerusalem on the north part. OK, so they both of them. So they went both of them together. Turn to Exodus 12. The purpose of the lamb in the Passover service. Very, very important symbolism. And again, I, I do believe that Jesus is as much lamb as he is 
God and lion and man and rock, lively stone, words. He's all of those things. Christ is all, the Bible says, does it not? Christ is all and in all and in y'all. Thank you, Paul, for being one of us. In y'all. Exodus 12, verse 3. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. In other words, if, you, if it was just you and your wife, I don't know if you've ever looked at old people's groceries when they're in Walmart buying food. They buy things in little portions. There ain't no sense in making a meal for six anymore. There ain't six of them left. Okay. So he said, if, you've, if it's just you and me, Ma, then you and me, Ma, go next door and you can have a lamb between yourselves. Because the thing was, the entire lamb had to be consumed, not to leave anything behind. So if the two people couldn't eat a whole lamb, then they had to join in with somebody else. Uh, and he said, um, verse 5, your lamb shall be without blemish. What does that mean? What does that represent? A lamb without blemish. Why did God say that? Sin is a blemish, a spot. Now, that could mean a sore, a wound, uh, or a darkened pigmentation of the skin, or darkened pigmentation of the wool from the lamb. If the lamb had a dark spot in its wool, it's not, he cannot be used. He cannot be used. If the lamb was sick, he could not be used. If the lamb had a wound in its flesh, he could not be used. He was to be discarded and cast away you could use him for anything else but you could not use him for this particular purpose what does that represent it represents christ and i want you to think about the idea of god using animals as sacrifices in the old testament especially that of a lamb or a goat what is the significance of a lamb in relation to what we call the substitutionary atonement. Substitute means something else is being killed rather than me. Some, something else is receiving my punishment for me in my place. They've got the firing squad, but they're not aiming it at me. They're aiming it at that animal over there. Why are they going to execute that animal and not me? I'm the one that committed the crime. I'm the one that deserved the execution. Why are they not shooting at me? Why are they killing a lamb? Lambs don't sin. They don't. There is no law that says, from God, that says lambs must do this. And if they don't do this, they're, they're sinners. Lambs are like every other member of the animal or plant kingdom. They do not possess reasoning, choice, logical decision-making skills. They have no ability. Dogs are going to do what dogs do. And can you stop them from doing it? No. Okay? Whether it's their daily hygiene performance. See, I'm trying to keep this G-rated. Their daily hygiene performance. Can you, can you train a dog to not do that? No! Especially when people come over. You can't do it. It's in his nature. He's going to be that way. The fact is, lambs never sin. And that's what it represents. The fact that Christ cannot sin. He cannot lie. He cannot do these things. He is the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. He has, 
What, is, what did James say pure religion was? Two things. To visit the widows and, the, and so on in their affliction and to keep yourself unspotted. I think so. Unspotted. Okay? In other words, don't go out, I'll use the word defiled, don't go out and get defiled in this world. Christ is the one who qualifies for that. His religion is right. Amen? Now follow his religion. And I'm not afraid of the word religion. Whoa, we're, we're, not, it's, we're not religious. We have a relationship. We're religious. I'm going to be honest with you. Amen? Um, verse 6, And you shall keep it unto the fourteenth day of the same month, and the whole assembly and the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. They shall take the blood and strike it on the two side posts and the upper door posts of the houses wherein they shall eat it. Look in verse 12. For God said, For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses wherein ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, it's where we get the word, pass over. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. The, here is Christ. Christ's purpose is to remove transgressions from his people. And just as the blood covered the door, the opening of their dwelling place, so the blood covers our transgressions. When God sees us, he does not see us as being defiled or spotted by sin. We are covered in those white blood cells, the blood cells that attack uncleanness, that dissolve uncleanness, that consume uncleanness, and makes it so that it looks like the uncleanness was never there to begin with. Amen. Amen. If you go look right now, I don't have a speeding ticket record of that ticket that I got in Hillsboro. It was expunged by rule of the court. Keep your nose clean, Mike. Don't speed through town no more. And I didn't. Now, I can tell I'm getting older every day. Because now I am setting my cruise control right on the speed limit. Everywhere I go. It's annoying me. But anyway... That record is gone. That judge said, if you don't get any more speeding tickets, this will be like it never happened. And I went, oh, I know what that is. Christ did that. That's why he's the lamb. He, he really is the lamb. He has to be the lamb. If he's not really the lamb, he's not qualified. He's not qualified. He is a lamb. By the way, what do his hairs look like? Like wool. I'd say that he's a lamb. He's got horns, doesn't he? Okay, seven horns. That's a little odd. But we'll get used to it in time. Amen. Seven eyes. That's really odd. But we'll get used to that too in time. All right. Uh, what do you do with the odd number eyeball? Stick in the middle, I guess. Three on one side, three on the other. One stuck in the middle. But he is a lamb. In every sense of the word, Christ is, this is not a metaphor. This is not an anthropomorphism. This is not a metonym of any kind. It's not just a symbolic thing. It, Christ is that lamb. He is the perfect, sinless, spotless, firstborn lamb had to be. Had to be the firstborn lamb. Couldn't be the second youngest brother, whatever. Had to be the firstborn because it had to break the matrix of the womb of its lamb mother to be qualified for this little deal here. Uh, I'm going to hold on to that because that's a that's a neat teaching in itself about the scapegoat. I love that. You ever been made a scapegoat, a fall guy for somebody? You ever taken the blame for something you didn't do? You ever get a whipping you didn't deserve? No, you didn't. You, if, just because you didn't have it coming for that day, that means something else you got away with. 
Yeah, I know. I, I know how we thought about it at the time. It's not fair. I'm getting whipped for something I didn't do. Yeah. God, thank you for my mommy. Amen. Amen.